The title of this morning's message as we're going through this series is How to Be Happy in Life. Now, I know some of you are saying, God doesn't call us to be happy. He calls us to be joyful. Happiness is circumstantial and joyful is deep-seated. Yes. But I must tell you this. Jesus himself said the word blessed, and blessed means, oh, how happy. So we got to not just throw it out the window that God never wants you to be happy. Have some grace and listen to the word of God. There was once a test actually done, and this was actually done in 2022, so not long ago. It was called the happiness test. And the happiness report took 12,000 consumers and business leaders across 14 different countries, and this was some of their results. 45% of people have not felt happy in more than two years. 25% have even forgotten completely what it is to be happy. And 78% would pay a premium for true happiness. That's almost 8 out of 10 people. And here's the good news. God has already paid the price. He's paid the premium, right? So that you could be blessed. So that you could find what life is truly about. You just have to receive it. And as we get into this this morning... To truly understand what Jesus said about living a happy life, we go back to our Creator, we go back to our Lord, we see what He has to say, and we begin this series, in a, a mini-series, you might say, in what's called the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew 5 through 7. It's one of five discourses that Matthew records for us. And we realize that our King has something to say about life. He has something to say, and we need to listen up. And so the first 12 verses are what are known as the Beatitudes. And you break them down simply as the inward ones, the upward ones, and the outward ones. And that's what we're going to see. These nine blessings are not traits of the super saints, but they're available for every believer to enjoy what God has intended life to be like. Here's your take home. The blessed life is the life that's in line with God's word and surrender to Jesus as Lord and Savior. As simple as that. C.S. Lewis said this, God cannot give us happiness and peace apart from, from himself because it is not there. There is no such thing. Think about that. There is no such thing as happiness and peace apart from Jesus. There's fragments of it. There's false things by it. But if you really want true happiness and peace... It begins with Jesus Christ. Satan has duped men into thinking that following God is a bummer. It's not going to be a blessing, right? That somehow it's going to be restrictive in life. But those who have surrendered their heart to Jesus Christ find that God becomes your all in all. He becomes a blessing in your life. And you all of a sudden realize, I am forgiven. I have heaven. I'm going to see Jesus. And there is nothing this world can touch when it comes to those things. It's amazing to to do that. And so how does it all start? What are the principles of his kingdom for us to align our lives with, to truly be happy? Chapter 5, verse 1. And seeing the multitudes, he went up on the mountain, and when he was seated, his disciples came to him. Then he opened his mouth and taught them. Now let me give you a running start. Jesus has called his disciples to come follow him. Some of them are, are right there in the midst of this. He has begun his ministry up in the Galilee area. Verse 23 of chapter 4 says, Jesus went about in Galilee teaching in the synagogues, preaching the gospel of the kingdom, and healing all kinds of sicknesses and all kinds of diseases. I mean, this is is amazing. Can you imagine for a second you're there? And I mean, it would be so exciting. Hey, I'm going to see Jesus today. I have no idea what he's going to do. He's going to teach me things of God's word. He's going to interact with people. Who knows what's going to happen? I mean, it was exciting to say, Let's go hang out with Jesus. And so here are all these people gathering together with them. And the Sea of Galilee is a really mountainous kind of area, uh, hilly. There's a natural amphitheater there as the winds off the sea carry his voice. And here's what you see right here. This is it. That would be that grassy area uh, that that Jesus would have been at the shores speaking to the people uh, and and then naturally hearing it. Anybody been to Israel and has, has been to this place? You've seen that. You can stand at the seashore and talk in a normal tone, and it actually carries. It's pretty fascinating. It's a natural amphitheater there. 
But here's where Jesus is instructing his disciples, unfolding these principles of his kingdom that is at hand. And we get to the first one there in verse 3. He says, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. So these are your inward attitudes as we begin this. Blessed, again, meaning, oh, how happy, and he says this over and over, are the poor in spirit. It, are the, the humbled, the bankrupt, the broken, the beggar. This is not physically poor, but spiritually poor. Every citizen in God's kingdom starts here. I see my emptiness. I see my spiritual bankruptcy. I see my poverty from sin and my need for salvation if I truly want to be happy. There are eight lessons here that we're going to discover in how to cultivate a happy life, and this is the first one. Happiness begins with brokenness. That's a hard thing because the world says, hey, no, happiness starts when you add all these things to your life. Where God says, listen, if you truly want to be happy, it starts first with this brokenness where I say, Lord, I am absolutely dependent upon you, surrendered at your feet. I'm lost without you. It begins with humility before God. J.C. Ryle said, humility is the very first letter of the alphabet of Christianity. We must begin low if we would build high. And so we look at that. And when I acknowledge my spiritual bankruptcy before the Lord, and I place my trust in Jesus, look at the reward, the blessing that's promised. For theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Isn't that beautiful to know? Because in this life, you're going to have times when you'll, you may have some riches, but you may not. But God promises every single one of us that in that place of abandonment and brokenness, I have now punched my ticket to all the riches of heaven and the glories to come and a relationship with the living God. It's a beautiful thing to consider. Verse 4, he says, number 2, Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. And this mourning has to do with weeping and wailing as if you've lost a loved one. Some of you have been through that even recently. The citizens of heaven, the citizens of his kingdom, don't take sin lightly. It, it impacts you. There's a heaviness of heart. There's a brokenness that comes with your own sin. And it's often expressed in tears. Let me ask you, just on a personal level, when was the last time you broke over your own sin? I found it personally in my own life in different seasons and different times. Usually starts with, I'm, I'm just away with the Lord and it's just, you know, kind of me and Him. Worship is, is going and I'm singing a song and all of a sudden God just starts to begin to say, hey, here's where your heart is. And it's such a heaviness and it's such a brokenness that you find yourself just weeping before the Lord going, Lord, the ugliness of my heart. Oh, it's not like you're going, oh, there's these radical sins going on in my life. It's just all of a sudden when I'm in the presence of God who is all holy, every little detail, every small thing gets exposed because of his holiness. And you find this brokenness happening. You know it's good, but boy, mourning over your sin is something that needs to happen on a regular basis. And in that moment, you find the Holy Spirit speak to your heart. As you're broken before him, you find the blessedness of his goodness. And he says, hey, I still love you. I forgive you because of the cross. Let's get up and let's keep going forward. And there's nothing on earth that compares to that. That's why he says, blessed are those who mourn for they shall be what? Comforted. How does God comfort us? Does he say, hey, just grab a warm, fuzzy blanket and a bowl of ice cream, Jess? No. <laughs> he says, one, he gives you the word of God. Listen to what Isaiah says in chapter 40, 1 and 2. Comfort, comfort my people, says your God. Speak tenderly to Jerusalem and proclaim to her that her hard service has been completed, that her sin has been paid for, and she has received from the Lord, Lord's hand double for all her sins. When you are hurting, turn to the word of God. The second thing he gives us is not just the word of God, he gives, shows us the work of God. And oftentimes when you're hurting, fall back on what you've seen God do in the past. 
Uh, it's so important for us. He points us to the cross, which is the fulfillment and the statement of his love for you and I. See, you and I are like, remember Mary Magdalene there in John 20? When she came to the tomb, the stones rolled away, and she's sitting there. She's weeping. Somebody stole the body of Jesus. She can't see through all the tears. Every emotion is going crazy. She's got all kinds of questions. All she sees is an empty tomb, lots of questions, lots of pain, and some strange gardener over here until he speaks his or her name. And then she falls at his feet and says, Rabboni, teacher. You see, how often in our pain we need to not only hear the word of God clearly, but we need to see the work of God, what he's done for us, risen again. We always go back to that. And the third thing that we see is the witness of the Holy Spirit. The word of God will speak to you. The work of God testifies to you. And the witness of the Spirit in your heart says, I am a God of all comfort. I comfort you in your sorrows and your brokenness over sin. He hasn't left you. So here's your second lesson. Lesson number two is happy people don't deny their hurts. They allow God to comfort them when they are hurting. You're not going to resist the Holy Spirit. You're not going to push off his word. You're not going to deny the work of the cross, which is his ultimate expression to say, I love you, check this out. But you're going to embrace it all. And in the process of that, you find God comforting your soul. Verse 5, blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. What is meekness? It's been considered gentleness or humble in spirit. The opposite would be a prideful, arrogant heart. Again, these are inward attitudes. Sometimes we get a picture of meekness as this weak, nerdy, little wimpy guy. A better picture of meekness would be power under control, would be a picture of a stallion that has been broken. There's incredible power in that horse. There's incredible ability, but it is harnessed the right way to be productive. We find Moses in Numbers chapter 12. He was called the meekest man on the face of the earth. And when you look at Moses' life, he understood raw power for the first 40 years of his life. He killed an Egyptian, right? He did it by his own flesh. And then he understood no power the next 40 years of his life when he's back on the backside of a desert with no... He didn't own anything. He's taking care of his father's sheep. He is crushed and broken. And that man who knew his own failures and his raw abilities and that raw power, and then he knew brokenness before God was the one that God called for the next 40 years to say, go in my power and you'll do great things. And we see a man lead the children of Israel and the miraculous happened. We want that type of meekness, power under control. Meekness is listed as a fruit of the spirit-controlled life in Galatians 5. And the promised blessing is that they will inherit the earth. This is not material gain. It's that you are going to rule and reign with Christ when he comes down to rule on this earth for a thousand years. It's a beautiful picture. But lesson number three is this. Happy people are gentle people. They really are gentle. There's character transformation. They understand brokenness and they extend grace and they say, there go I except for the grace of God. Stories told of a, a couple, who, an elderly couple, they're on a road trip and they stop at a, a roadside cafe and, you know, they, they eat their meal and, and then they get back in the car and begin to leave. And they left the restaurant, resume their trip and, and the, the wife uh, the elderly woman unknowingly left her glasses on the table, but she didn't realize it till they're 45 minutes into the trip, still going. Has it ever happened to any of you? Okay. God's calling you, buddy. <laughs> it's got your number. So on this trip, they're, for, they're into this trip, they're going, and all of a sudden she realized, I left my glasses on the table. And she's, uh, you know, kind of ashamed about it, but then they couldn't find a place to turn around, and it took a while, and they finally finally turned around. On the way back, the husband is just grumbling, complaining. I can't believe you did this. Da, 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 da. And she's just bearing it up going, uh, let's just get back there. And you know, mistakes happen and things like that. But all the way back, he's complaining. Classic grumpy man. <laughs> he wouldn't let, let it go for a single minute. All the way back until they finally got to that restaurant and she gets out of the car and she begins to hurry inside and he says, oh yeah, hey, while you're in there, can you grab my hat and the credit card? <laughs> Are you extending gentleness to others? 
Or are you the grumpy old man? Listen, we all fail. I love Philippians 4, 5. It says, the Lord, let your gentleness be known to all. The Lord is at hand. You can be gentle because God was gentle with you. So we see this progression. Here we see the first things. A happy life progression is I acknowledge my spiritual poverty. It leads to mourning over my sinfulness, which leads to meekness in my heart, a life controlled by the Spirit. And there's all promises attached to it. What's happening is God is doing his royal flush in you. The king of kings is saying, let me flush out all of you and begin to fill you with all of me. So the inward attitudes then lead us to the upward appetites. Check this out in verse 6. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be filled. Now, one of the things that you know you're alive is because God's put these drives in you. These drives in you, you actually hunger, you thirst, you need air. Those drives are there. That's one of the checks. You know you're alive. But spiritually, there should be a hunger and thirst for his righteousness. I want right standing with God, which comes through the blood of Jesus Christ. He's made me pure and holy and saved me. I want right living with God, a holiness in pursuit of my life. And I want right living with others where they may see, God, your good works through me and glorify you in heaven. I want those things. That's the progression. That's what we're striving for. And when we do, the believer is consumed, in a sense, with this mind of Christ. Lord, be a part of my life. Change me from the inside out. I want to hunger for you. I was doing a funeral yesterday after this one, went to another one, and, uh, and, and, the, and the gal who had passed away, in her Bible, she had these prayers written down. And one of the prayers, and I read it there, and it really impacted me, one of the prayers that she wrote was this, Dear Heavenly Father, I want Jesus to be more important in my heart and life than I am. In Jesus' precious name. Is that your prayer? But I hunger for you more than anything else. You're my lifeline. And God says this promise, when your heart is hungry for him, simply this, you will be filled. Isn't it so wonderful to know that our King of Kings doesn't leave you lacking? He doesn't say, sorry, you're last in line, maybe tomorrow. He doesn't say, call me in a month or two, let's see what we can work out. He says, the moment you hunger for me, I'm ready to fill you, overflowing. And so call upon him. Lesson number four, happy people chase after God's righteousness in their life. We are not sinless, but we do begin to sin less and less as life goes on. We're not perfect, we just know we're forgiven. And they pursue godliness and holiness because they want to please their king. Verse 7, blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. And mercy is just showing compassion to people in need. It's not getting what you deserve, right? And when we do that, we find that we obtain mercy. When we give out mercy, God blesses us with mercy. It's a beautiful thing. If I want God's mercy in my life, then start showing it to others around you. Listen to Matthew chapter 6. If you forgive other people, Jesus said, when they sin against you, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive others their sins, your Father will not forgive your sins. In other words, God makes this connection between what you receive and what you give out. If you're there saying, God, forgive me of my sins, but I can't forgive them, there's a disconnect in what God is wanting to do in your life. You're missing it. Like the sinful woman who came before and fell at Jesus' feet and began to, to weep at, at his feet and, and wash his feet with her hair and cry over her sins. What did he say to that man in the house? He said, the one who has been forgiven much loves much. So you see the connection? The mercy you show others testifies how much you have grasped the mercy God has upon your own life. Be a merciful person. Lesson number five. Happy people love to show mercy to others. In fact, it could be a marker of your spiritual maturity. Are you critical of others? Over and over and over, very judgmental. You're kind of like the, the Christian who says, Lord, I love you, but I just can't stand your people. Why can't they be all like me? It doesn't work that way. We want to be merciful to others because God is merciful to us. Verse 8. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. These are these upward appetites. 
I aim towards holiness and integrity and purity and that the reward I get to see God, both today and tomorrow in eternity. Hebrews 12, 14 says, Make every effort to live in peace with everyone and to be holy. Without holiness, no one will see the Lord. So I need to have a striving in my heart for God's holiness. God said, be holy for I am holy. Be holy in all your conduct. And so that upward desire for God is a life that says, Lord, I want to have purity in my heart, integrity, honesty, and strive after you. Psalms 24, verse 3 through 5, David says, Who may ascend to the mountain of the Lord, who may stand in his holy place? The one who has clean hands and a pure heart, who does not trust in an idol or swear by false gods, they will receive blessing from the Lord and vindication from God, their Savior. So there's that divine connection. Listen, when you have accepted Christ, you positionally are considered holy and pure because of the blood of Christ. You have a position of purity. But then you are responsible to have a practice of purity, saying, God, change me from the inside out. I want to be like you. And purity is not some holier-than-thou type of mentality, pridefully boasting. Oh, they don't do these. Purity is a sincerity of heart. It's with integrity. It's with unadulterated motives. It just says, Lord, I want to love you because you have loved me. Change me from the inside out. I want to see you, God. I want to see you working in my life. I want to see you working through my life. There's nothing greater than watching God use your life and nothing greater than the very presence of God. It says in Psalm 16, in your presence is fullness of joy and at your right hand are pleasures forevermore. You want a joyful life? You want a life filled with pleasure? Get to the presence of God. And from that, you'll see it extended out in a beautiful way. Lesson number six, happy people cultivate a pure heart. They look to others with purity. They look to the Lord to purify themselves. And in that revelation, there is often a purification in pursuit of holiness. We see how we are to see ourselves, but in the last three, we then see the outward actions, how we're to treat others. Verse 9, blessed are the peacemakers for they shall be called sons of God. Peacemaker is one who is a mediator between two opposing parties, right? You're looking to reconcile and restore. We have so many problems with each other. We always have. From the very beginning, there has been friction. There has been factions. There has been issues. Welcome to Sinland, right? It's ripped us apart. And yet God calls us as a, as a citizen of his kingdom to strive to be a peacemaker, to reconcile not just people with God, but reconcile people with each other, believers with each other. And when we do it rightly, what does he call us? We're sons of God. We are a reflection of Jesus Christ himself when we walk in those ways. Listen to what 2 Corinthians 5 says. All this is from God who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. God was reconciling the world to himself in Christ, not counting people's sins against them, and he has committed to us the message of reconciliation. We are therefore Christ's ambassadors, as though God were making his appeal through us. We implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. God made him who had no sin to be sin for us, so that we might become the righteousness of God. Sad to say, too often today, Christians are war makers or troublemakers, and not most likely peacemakers. It just takes a brief moment to look around. We'll fight about anything and everything. We'll fight about the color of a carpet. Why not? Because it's there. We'll say, my right, your rights. We'll fight about how things are done. We'll fight about what's going on in society. We'll fight about a movie. We'll fight about music. We'll fight about all these things. And here's what happens a lot of times. The world is more hurting. Believers are more at each other's throat, and the enemy just sits back and laughs. But when we could be peacemakers, helping people bridge the gap to the Lord who loved them and created them, Yes, dealing with sin, that's necessary. 
but looking at the grace and the love of Christ who came to save you. When we can deal with each other and go, hey, man, can't we all get along? <laughs> when we can deal with each other and just say, look, let's look at the bigger picture. In light of eternity, who cares about that issue? Really? Who cares about that argument? Does the carpet color truly matter? It's going to get ripped out eventually, but people will divide over it. It's crazy. And God has called us to be peacemakers. Lesson number seven. Happy people seek reconciliation, not retaliation. They make a habit. Yes, hurts are going to happen, but they make a habit of, I want to be a reconciler. I want to see people restored relationally. I want to see the, the, the blessings and not the bitterness. You see, when you start to get bitter, it's like drinking poison and expecting the other person to die. When you get bitter, it's like an infection in your body that unless you deal with it, you can't blame anybody else. You want to be justified. I have a right to be bitter while you just get infected over and over and over. You see, here, here's, here's this reality. Forgiveness says that sin does matter. It's not neglecting it. That sin matters because the cross took care of it. Forgiveness says that pain hurts. And Jesus knows how I felt because he pinned himself on the cross. And forgiveness, it says that sin isn't fair. True, it isn't fair. It wasn't fair for Jesus either. But forgiveness says that sin is paid for. And I have to let it go. I want to be a peacemaker. To not forgive others, listen, to not forgive others, in a sense you are saying, God, your cross is enough for me, but not for them. I want you to let that sink in. Your cross is enough for me, but not for them. You have misunderstood the cross of Christ. Oh, it's hard. I'm not saying it's just an easy thing to do. It's hard. It's a spiritual work. But when you set your heart to say, Lord, I want to be a peacemaker. I want to be free from this bitterness. I want to walk in a way of forgiveness. I need your help, Lord, to do this. You'll find that burden start to roll off. And you will eventually get to a place where you're actually praying, God, would you bless this person who hurt me? Jesus said, pray for those who use you and say all manner of evil things against you. Pray for them. And when you're at a place of praying that God would bless them, then you know your heart's in a good place. And bitterness doesn't have roots ripping you off. Let's finish this up. Uh, verse 10. Sometimes people don't always respond rightly. It says, Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Jesus promised that as we live for him, not everybody's going to accept it. He said, if they hate me, they'll hate you in John 15. And that's this reality, is that those who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus will suffer persecution. Do you know, guys, we are so blessed in this land. Yes, we get some persecution, but it's nothing compared to everything else. Do you know right now, every five minutes, there's a Christian who is killed for his faith? Every five minutes in this earth. Do you know that there are 360 million Christians persecuted worldwide? That's a ratio of one per seven. We need to pray for them to stand strong. Jesus said, listen, when you are persecuted for righteousness' sake, my sake, not doing stupid things, when you're persecuted for my sake, understand this, the kingdom of heaven is yours. And then he goes on, he says, blessed are you. Now he changed it from blessed are these, but now he says you, speaking to his disciples, when they revile and persecute you and say all kinds of evil against you falsely for my sake, rejoice and be exceedingly glad. The rejoicing is, is jump around and leap for joy. Hey, I get to be persecuted. For great is your reward in heaven, for so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. We're blessed, even though our enemies may mistreat us. Because what they do does not determine God's heart for you and I. He says, listen, you can rejoice with exceeding gladness for two reasons. One, you have a reward to come. And two, you're following in the righteous footsteps 
of those who have gone before you. It's good to know when you've been thunked for your faith, you're in the company of people who understand that, who've been there too. Lesson number eight, as we finish, is this happy people live for more than this life. They're looking beyond the now and the comforts and conveniences. They're looking for the legacy of Jesus, lived out through them, to leave a lasting testimony. I mean, Jesus says, what does it profit a man if he gains the whole world but loses his own soul? So let's strive for those things of the Lord. And we'll find our King of Kings working His principles out through our life. We'll have those inward attitudes that are pleasing to Him. We'll have that upward appetite that says, Lord, all of you and only you. And we'll have those outward actions reaching our world the way Jesus truly intended us to be. Let's pray. Amen.